Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Particle Size Distribution of Cement Using Laser Diffraction. My name is Sim Pham from Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter. Beckman Coulter serves a diverse range of customers in the industrial market in areas such as aerospace, automobile, agriculture, chemicals, construction, fuels, electronics, just to name a few. Beckman is a key supplier to quality control and standard operating processes with a range of products in air and liquid particle counting, as well as laser diffraction for particle size distribution. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would like now to introduce today's speaker, Edward Hoff. Edward Hoff is a graduate of the University of Miami with a BS in chemistry. He is a 43-year veteran of Coulter Corporation and Beckman Coulter in the Particle Characterization Division. Ed started his career as a chemist in the Applications Lab, eventually transitioning into product development and marketing manager roles. He has helped develop the Multisizer Series, LS Series for Laser Diffraction, and the N4 Dynamic Light Scattering System, just to name a few. In recent years, Ed moved into the field sales and is now a sales specialist. With 43 years in the particle characterization industry, Ed has a wealth of application knowledge across numerous markets. I will now turn it over to Ed for his presentation. Thank you, Sue. Uh, today, as, as Sue mentioned, we'll be discussing uh, particle sizing of cement uh, using laser diffraction type instrumentation. And the areas that we'll be uh, uh, discussing will be the importance of uh, particle size analysis for cement, uh, the use of laser diffraction, uh, also the LS13320, which is Beckman Coulter's laser diffraction system, um, and the importance of uh, how this has transitioned in the marketplace. Um, we'll be discussing flexibility of modules, that is, how to present samples to the instrumentation, and also uh, quality data. Uh, comparing to uh, ISO standards as, as well as uh, NIST uh, 114 SRMs, 114Q for cement. So traditionally, um, methods used in the cement industry have been Blaine number, uh, Wagner turbidity meter, and uh, probably more commonly SIDS. Uh, but these only provide uh, a single number or limited size information uh, about the cements. Um, and what has happened over the years as cement requirements have, uh, uh, high performance cements have been needed with uh, uh, more stringent requirements, uh, uh, the particle size distribution information was, is, is, is needed in more detail to more properly uh, control the quality of the uh, cement and versus its performance, desired performance. Um, a complete size distribution has been increasingly important. Uh, and so over the last 20 years or so, um, technology advances have uh, uh, been moving toward the laser diffraction uh, type instrumentation for a variety of reasons that we'll get to in a moment. Um, but one thing you want to consider is that not all laser diffraction uh, uh, particle size analyzers are created equal. They may be based on laser diffraction, but how you implement and, and design uh, everything from sample handling to optics uh, will contribute to the quality of the results you get. This is just a, 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 an example of some distributions that are quite can be quite complicated. Uh, usually, distributions are not uh, Gaussian or very symmetrical. They could have multiple peaks because you're typically dealing with blends of materials that might be uh, uh, being measured. 
And one of the key things you want to uh, consider in a in a instrumentation is that you can analyze these without uh, prior knowledge of what the distribution shape is, and um, um, so that that's a, a consideration to consider when you uh, are, are looking at diffraction type instruments. Now, if your particle sizes are uh, too large, uh, you have an abnormal amount of uh, uh, large particles present, uh, you can get crumbling of your cement, um, and like in the left photographs. Um, uh, and if they're too small, uh, too many fines, you can get cracking um, uh, of your cement, especially with uh, temperature changes or pressure. Um, or stress on the on the cement. So these are things you want to uh, try to optimize. And the only way to properly do this is to have uh, really a detailed particle size distribution and trying to figure this out from uh, instrumentation or, or uh, prior uh, devices that would only give single numbers or a uh, limited number of uh, channels like in sieves. Now the advantages of laser diffraction is is uh, multi-folded. Um, these instruments are, are quite easy to use. Um, they cover a broad dynamic range. In other words, from submicron particles to uh, usually multiple millimeters, uh, so a couple of thousand microns down to below a micron. Uh, they can do this quite fast. Um, Typically, results can be in one to three minutes, uh, thereabouts. Could be a little longer, depending on if uh, running liquid systems. Um, the other advantage is these type of instruments are quite reproducible. And um, uh, also, uh, operator independent in, in the results. Um, there's uh, they, These kinds of instrumentation can be uh, run in a dry state uh, or a liquid uh, suspension, such as uh, alcohols or, or uh, hexane or some other solvent that might be uh, desired to run. Uh, so particle systems can be uh, dispersed in that uh, or run in a totally dry state. Um, and as mentioned above, uh, very important is the uh, uh, operator uh, independent results. Uh, the instrument doesn't care usually what type of, uh, who, who's putting the sample in, as long as it's a representative sample. That's, that's really the key for any particle size analysis. Um, brief discussion on ISO standards, uh, ISO standard 13320. Um, discusses uh, some key factors that are important for laser diffraction that one wants to consider uh, uh, in their design. ISO uh, took these into consideration. So resolution and sensitivity of the result, in other words, you want to be able to resolve different sizes uh, easily and be all, also able to sense uh, small changes uh, in, a, in a particle system, uh, if the distribution is changing, be able to see these readily. Um, reproducibility, of course, is highly very important, and then accuracy of the results. Um, and we'll discuss these in more detail uh, uh, later in the lecture. The LS13320, uh, of course, the, the name uh, LS13320 comes from the chapter number for ISO standard, uh, mainly because this was the first instrument to truly follow the full standard, the ISO standard. And that's where it was uh, named from, uh, LS standing for light scatter. And um, uh, there's two types of models in the optical uh, bench we'll get into in a moment in detail, but basically you have what's called a multi-wavelength optical bench, which uh, allows one, if one, if if you're running with uh, liquid-based samples, can cover 17 nanometers to 2,000 microns in a single scan. Um, and then there's the single-wavelength um, optical bench. It has less optics in it, 
does not have the bottom end, the optics. Um, and, and so you're covering 0.375 microns to 2,000 microns. Um, and uh, two ideal modules that, that we offer um, for uh, that would be ideal for cement if one was going to want to run in liquid-based systems um, where you can typically liquid systems, you can control dispersion a, a little bit more. Uh, but that may not be how the uh, powder is uh, being utilized. It may be utilized in the dry state. But uh, we have the universal liquid module. And then also for doing uh, in a dry state, totally dry state, uh, the tornado dry powder system. And we'll discuss these in details in a moment. So some key features of of uh, the LS and uh, that one wants to consider, uh, and, and these are, uh, of course, benefits for the cement applications. Um, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, not wanting to, for complex distributions, not wanting to have to input information about uh, distribution shape. We usually don't know this prior to analyzing the sample. so. Uh, we have uh, essentially what's called automodality, we call it, where there's no requirement for operator input into distribution shape. Um, you don't need to know the, um, the uh, is it bimodal, monomodal, narrow, broad, multi-peaked. Uh, you don't know, have to know anything about the uh, uh, sample uh, distribution shape to uh, get the proper, uh, the correct answer. Um, secondly, on resolution and sensitivity, uh, the LS series has what uh, we, we call a unique binocular optics. Um, so it has, uh, uh, allows us to pick up a wide range of light scatter, uh, wide angular range that is, and uh, uh, we uh, we detect these this wide angular range using uh, 126 detector diode array, and and uh, this is uh, very important for uh, giving us uh, uh, that resolution and sensitivity to to detect very subtle changes in distributions that one might have uh, if the process changes, because uh, you want to know when things change uh, quickly. So you can make adjustments in your process to keep the desired particle size. On the other side, accuracy and precision, it's controlled by um, uh, the angular position or knowing the angles uh, of light scatter. You basically know two, uh, two things about your uh, uh, particle size distribution. You know the angle and you know the amount of light that's being scattered due to your particle size distribution. From that information, the particle size distribution is a calculation, uh, converting that light scatter, uh, utilizing either Fraunhofer or Me theory to uh, get the appropriate and accurate particle size distribution. Um, and, and positioning and, and aligning of, of that system is extremely important um, and we have this, uh, I'll show a picture of it uh, later, an X pattern low angle detector that allows us to position uh, and hold about a one micron tolerance on positioning that laser beam. Uh, and this gets us the uh, very accurate and very precise results so we can get good precision as, as well as uh, very accurate results. And then uh, uh, lastly, um, uh, ease of operation. Uh, most of these systems uh, have built in or you can create SLPs or standard operating uh, procedures and essentially allow a one button operation uh, 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 for your uh, particle size analysis. So uh, these instruments can be used uh, by uh, uh, production people uh, um, uh, they're not very complicated to use, so um, the results are analyzed quite fast utilizing this mode. And in systems, we either automatically clean themselves if it's, a, if it's a wet system or be ready for the next analysis in a short amount of time 
with very minimal contact with the computer. Um, also available on the uh, LS is uh, for those that want to correlate back to screen sizes or mesh units, um, there's a uh, SID stack correlation uh, you can use when you want to if you uh, desire this capability. Um, and so we can individually correlate to individual screen sizes and, and you would select the screens that you use um, and you can correlate the results so the LS can give out the same type of uh, correlation. Uh, because you, uh, uh, laser diffraction instruments measure more of the volume of the particle, so when you're sitting, you're measuring the middle dimension of a particle. So you can correlate back to this size. You can uh, apply a correlation factor uh, in the uh, instrument's uh, output to uh, correlate directly to screens that you use. Uh, briefly, this is a, a layout of, of the optics. Um, in this area here, we have the binocular optics and then our low angle detector, which I'll show a picture of uh, in detail a little bit later. Um, the upper section of the instrument is what we call PIDS optics. I'm not going to go into details of what PIDS is all about at this, uh, during this lecture, but uh, suffice to say this allows for the low end measurement uh, below a half a micron, four tenths of a micron, uh, and down to 17 nanometers. Um, um, for very accurate measurement and very high resolution measurements down in that region. Um, another uh, sort of unique feature of this, this coiled area here uh, is a, uh, essentially a spatial filter, but it's a fiber optic cable. It, it's a patented design of Beckman Coulter's. And um, this essentially eliminates the need for about um, uh, 20 pinholes and in, in, in lenses and things um, that can obviously go out of adjustment from uh, older design systems. Uh, and utilizing this fiber optic cable uh, allows a, a very clean signal to be, because uh, what you're trying to create is a very clean signal uh, from the laser and a very stable signal. Um, and so this allows for uh, great uh, uh, help in being able to, if one is needed, to actually up, uh, uh, put a new laser in a system in the field without any problem. Uh, briefly, the um, two modules that I mentioned, uh, the universal liquid module is our, um, uh, uh, for running any kind of uh, uh, fluid, it can handle any class D solvent. Uh, holds approximately 120, 125 mils of fluid, and this is circulated by a, uh, a centrifugal uh, custom design pump um, uh, designed specifically for particles, uh, handling particles. It can work with uh, aqueous fluids as well, uh, but obviously in cement you're going to be running solvents if you're going to be running in the wet state. Uh, depending on which optical bench one has, you can go as, as uh, either 17 nanometers to 2,000 or 0.375 to 2,000, depending on which bench you have. Uh, the, this module uh, will rinse itself between runs. It can auto dilute in case you've added too much sample. Um, we want to keep a, a certain range of, of uh, obscuration so we can get light through the uh, sample as they pass the laser. It has built-in sonication. This is an optional item if one wants it. Um, and uh, it can also fill from a, a built-in pump so it can fill from a container automatically. On the dry side, um, the amount of sample one uses is based uh, primarily on the size distribution. Uh, you typically like to add enough powder to uh, run about 20 to 30 seconds. This should uh, give you a, a very good representative sample. Uh, so that would typically be your run time. Um, and no matter which bench you have, uh, the size range running dry is going to be 0.375 microns to 2,000 microns. 
and it uses vacuum only. Uh, we use like a vacuum uh, uh, cleaner, high quality vacuum cleaner we offer that's well grounded so you don't have any static forces or anything like that. Um, and I'll get into its unique design, why it's called Tornado in a moment. Um, and um, uh, But this uh, module is designed to disperse the powders very well and, um, and essentially be ready to operate. There's no cleanup when you run dry uh, because all the powder is passed through and went gone to vacuum. Um, so you're essentially ready for your next analysis immediately. The universal liquid module is uh, uh, pictured uh, uh, above, uh, next to my slides here, and uh, uh, essentially in the center section there is where you would uh, uh, put your sample. Uh, you're only needing to put in a small amount of sample. Um, these can be pre-dispersed outside the instrument, or you can add directly. Uh, a dry powder or, or uh, a, a suspension already directly to the module. Uh, so if you want to prepare the sample in the module, you can do that since it has built-in sonication. You can control the power and the uh, sonication time and so forth appropriate to the uh, material you're going to be analyzing and what might be part of an SOP. This would all be controlled by the computer. Um, you're continually uh, keeping the particles suspended, so you have a homogeneous uh, mixture, and uh, uh, these are, are going through the uh, uh, passing the laser beam. Uh, so we can definitely uh, multiple times, so we can definitely get a good picture of what the uh, distribution, uh, light scatter intensity distribution looks like. So we can then calculate the appropriate particle size. Um, most people are tending to start going to the dry powder systems uh, because of its ease of operation. There is no sample prep. You're taking the powder directly. You get a representative sample, and you're placing it in a uh, what looks like a, a small graduated cylinder and uh, placing that in the sample module. This t uh, goes into the same orientation as the um, uh, liquid module, fits into the same slot. Um, and effectively, uh, uh, the dispersion is uh, going to be controlled by the uh, vacuum and the flow path and, and uh, also how the um, uh, dispersion takes place. And I'll show you some schematics in that in a moment. And, but one key thing about uh, this dry powder system is that it analyzes all the powder uh, that you give it. That's what dictates how long the instrument's going to run. So you might add, depending on the distribution, um, a half a gram to maybe a, a couple of grams, to, again, depending on the size distribution. The bigger the particles are, uh, the uh, more volume of powder you might have to run in a short period of time. But you're typically going to add a, about enough uh, material to run 20 to 30 seconds. But by analyzing all the powder, you eliminate any subsampling error, any segregation that could have taken place. Uh, once it's on an instrument, it doesn't matter because the instrument's going to analyze all the powder that you gave it. Um, this is a little closer uh, view of the material, uh, uh, of the module, and the uh, sample uh, chamber is right here where you're going to place the uh, sample in a cubette. And uh, we, it has a vortex type action. And this is a, a patented design uh, uh, that we created uh, uh, back a, a number of years ago. And uh, this design, we took into consideration the possible use of pressure uh, or in vacuum. In this, and uh, we worked out this unique system where uh, it only required a vacuum, uh, like from a vacuum cleaner type uh, device. And um, the con computer controls the exact vacuum that you put on the system, but you can typically are going to run with about 12 inches of uh, water vacuum. Um, 
uh, for most applications. Um, and in, basically, in detail of how it works is um, you have uh, an up and down platform that uh, that the uh, sample module is going uh, is positioned on. This platform rises and, and lowers. Uh, you have a fixed position suction probe. Um, and then the, uh, as the platform rises, the powder starts swirling around. Um, and I'll have another picture in a moment, uh, a little closer of the vortex uh, nature that's taking place. But the powder gets pulled up, flows through, and down through a measuring cell. This is a, a laminar flow cell that keeps the particle stream in a nice tight stream. Uh, with laminar flow uh, that's flowing through it uh, to keep that particle system stream. So it, it keeps your, uh, uh, actually it keeps the particles uh, in a close, close uh, uh, stream so you don't have a lot of spray. So there's uh, um, you essentially your windows and things like that in this closed chamber uh, essentially don't get dirty very often. Uh, so maybe a, a once a year they have to be wiped down, uh, depending on the <coughs> excuse me type of powders that you're going to be dealing with, and then out the vacuum. Um, and another uh, little closer up. What happens is we create uh, uh, vortices uh, right above the surface of the particles as the platform rises and particles start going through. The instrument, the computer, controls that platform that I mentioned because it wants to control the feed rate. <coughs> Excuse me. Wants to control the feed rate so we have a constant flow of, of particles uh, uh, in front of the beam. And uh, uh, also these vortexes uh, or like little mini tornadoes, so it creates a, a very high shear area, and um, uh, so you have high shear but low velocity, so you tend to disperse the powders uh, very well, and um, uh, and then of course the low velocity, we don't want them banging around or hitting any uh, hard uh, right angles or anything like that. So uh, 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 for cement, it's not quite as fragile. Um, but some applications, you could have fragile particles that might break if you have too much velocity. Uh, and this can happen in pressurized systems where you are forcing the particles under very high pressure. Uh, you can tend to break them. Um, but this is a more gentle uh, way of, of dispersing the particles and having them float through the instrument. And once, once the system has analyzed uh, everything in the container, that container platform, everything goes down to the uh, bottom uh, uh, of the starting position, and you remove the uh, cell. You know, and essentially, you're ready for the next sample. So uh, we'll discuss here and show some data here in a moment uh, for resolution, sensitivity, um, how it affects reproducibility and accuracy. So we'll uh, be showing some data and some additional slides here. Also, the uh, results here on 114Q. Um, so resolution and sensitivity is, is very important. It's controlled by the geometry, uh, the number, the position, and geometry of the detector elements. I mentioned earlier, we have a 126 de dio uh, detector diode array. And what you need to really define is this raw intensity data as pictured in the graph. And because what you get is, is uh, pictured in the right there, you'll get some pattern depending on the distribution of your particles. This pattern can vary. And the intensity of these rings can, and, and dark spots can vary. Uh, and so the better you can define this distribution of, of, your, uh, of your light scatter pattern, the more accurate uh, the results can be, uh, also the resolution and be able to determine uh, is it bimodal, monomodal, have three or four peaks or a little side peak that might be uh, not visible with some systems. 
um, we can we can make these measurements uh, because of the high number of detectors and the fact that we read these detectors simultaneously for the same particles. Um, so we can uh, make a very accurate measurement here. Because as I said earlier, you know two things, light, light intensity as a function of angle. So the better you position these things and measure these things, uh, the more accurate and, and, and precise your data is going to be. This is a, uh, a schematic drawing of the uh, uh, low angle detector array. And it forms what we call an X pattern uh, with the beam dump right in the center. Um, so right in the center, you have your beam dump. And that's where you're aligning the laser to, because that fixes the position. And as I said earlier, too, you might have angles as low as or under 0.02 degrees and out to uh, as far as 145. But uh, when you're dealing with particles, let's say 50 microns and above, um, uh, these low angle detectors are extremely important and the ability to align that laser um, is, is very important. Also, the sample handling of all these uh, uh, flowing uh, uh, representative powder, uh, or if it's in a liquid system, uh, keeping the particles suspended um, and, and homogeneous uh, throughout the uh, measurement is extremely important as well as the uh, optics. Um, but this allows us to uh, very easily uh, uh, position the laser beam. And when one does this, uh, uh, it takes a few seconds to do an alignment on the instrument. The instrument will automatically do this periodically. Uh, so the operator doesn't have to remember when to do it. Um, but this will ensure very accurate, very uh, precise results from both the instrument to instrument. Uh, so if you're comparing one plant to another, you should be getting the same results uh, and also within the same instruments, precision and accuracy is improved by this basic design. And discussing uh, accuracy, and I'll show some results in a moment. Uh, of course, accuracy is defined as, as uh, the closeness of a result to a true accepted value. So you're going to be running uh, controls um, or standards that, uh, and, and I'll show one in a moment. Uh, uh, but uh, in the ISO standard, uh, this is defined as uh, being able to do measure the D50 uh, the median uh, mean size uh, and um, be able to get uh, three measurements and the deviation should be less than 3%, which is pretty generous uh, by our standards, but uh, from the certified value and uh, uh, some results that are uh, displayed here is a, a Duke standard. This one's about one micron. Uh, uh, just shown as an example and looking at the results. And, and this has a 0.3%, uh, so it's 10 times better than what's required by the uh, uh, ISO standard um, as an example. And then last but not least, uh, when, when analyzing uh, real cement, utilizing uh, the NIST SRM 114Q, um, the um, uh, list values for the uh, uh, standard are the diamond-shaped positions um, with the blue lines being, you have to be within, uh, now the standards for uh, laser diffraction instruments, and one has to be within the blue lines for, uh, uh, to be acceptable. Um, and so what we did here is run both the tornado, the dry uh, module, and the universal liquid module. And um, we, in um, uh, the dry module is the dotted, uh, or the dash red line. And the universal liquid module is the smaller blue dots. 
and uh, you can see they're well within the error bars of, of the standard itself. Um, and and so this shows quite good agreement between both wet and dry. So as long as you can, uh, and cement typically disperses pretty well uh, both in a wet and dry state. So when, when things are, uh, there's no problem with dispersion or stickiness of, of materials, um, uh, wet and dry should agree with each other uh, similarly like this. Um, and this shows the uh, quality of data you can expect from from the LS uh, for running cements. And that's uh, pretty much my uh, uh, talk. I'll be available for questions here in a moment. If you have additional questions that come up, you think about things later, um, I've got an email address for Dave Dunham. Uh, he'll uh, be glad to take questions and uh, we'll get answers uh, back to you. Um, also, for those that might be attending the World of Concrete in Las Vegas this coming week, uh, we will have a booth there. Uh, N871 is our booth number. We'll be there and I'll be glad to answer any technical questions. Uh, also, we'll have a live uh, we'll have a live uh, 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 LS, so if you have any uh, samples, we'll be glad to run one or two samples for you and get your results. And I thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ed, very much for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience of how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Now, while the questions are coming in, we would like to conduct a poll asking how likely are you to recommend this webinar to a colleague. Please respond with your answer on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 being not likely at all and 5 being extremely likely. And our first question is, um, can you bring one of these systems to my location for demonstration? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, most all the uh, sales uh, reps in particle characterization have a uh, demo unit, and they can um, uh, that can certainly be arranged to come in and do a demonstration um, at your plant site. Um, also available, um, if you wish, is uh, you can submit samples to our applications lab, um, and uh, uh, we're glad to run them in our lab and get you the results right back. And uh, these, this is at a no charge, uh, of course, for lab samples, and of course, we'll be glad to show you the LS in, in doing a sample at your site. That's great. Our next question, um, Miguel asks, what, what is the life of the sensor? Um, typically, uh, lasers, these are solid state lasers, so they can run, depending on its use, if, it's tw if you're operational 24 hours a day, or um, let's say you're operational 24 hours a day, you're probably talking 8 to 10 years. Um, and if you're uh, going to be running just one or two shifts, uh, that could be somewhat a little bit longer. Um, I usually don't see or hear about lasers being replaced maybe 12 years out, 14 years out. So That's great. they last a long time. <laughs> That's great. Um, and you mentioned uh, the lab analysis. Um, one viewer asked, how do you submit a free lab analysis? Um, that's done. That can be done through our uh, uh, website. Uh, you can uh, uh, go to particle characterization and uh, access it through there uh, for submitting particles. Um, you can call up and discuss uh, your need with the, your local salesperson, particle characterization sales rep and he can give you the exact details for submitting a, a sample. Up to four samples are run at no charge, and um, uh, 
um, you know, and so that can be arranged. Uh, a lot of your communication will be all done through the web um, as far as downloading the application uh, application form uh, for the lab, and uh, and then it gives you details of send, where to send it and so forth. They're either going to be run in our Miami lab where these instruments are manufactured, uh, or our uh, Grants Pass, Oregon lab uh, for those that might be on the west coast uh, uh, a little closer. Uh, so those are two two locations for our laboratories. That's great, all those resources. Um, another person asked, how many samples can I run in a day? If you're running dry, uh, that's going to be the quickest way since you're not having to rinse the module. Uh, your typical analysis time might be between a minute to a minute and a half uh, per sample. So you can run uh, in, in an hour. You're going to you could run uh, 40 samples in an hour running dry. If you're constantly ready, you know, you have samples available and ready to feed, um, you can fill up these little cups. You get 10 cups with the instrument, and you can just constantly feed, and the instrument, the data is automatically being saved, so it's as fast as, you know, almost as fast as that you can feed samples to it and tell it to operate. So it's, it's, it's not difficult to do uh, a very high number in a day. Uh, an eight-hour day, um, so you, you know you're probably talking in the area maxing max out about thirty to forty samples, forty-five samples a, an hour. Wow, that's great. Uh, we have a lot of people who are interested in the lab analysis. So Beckman Coulter will send out a sample analysis link as a follow-up to this webinar, and you might be able to see this link um, in as it pops up right now. Um, okay, so if we have no more questions, um, then I would like to pass the control back to Ed and see if he has any um, last comments for the audience. Um, I wish to thank everybody for attending and uh, for those that are going to be in uh, Las Vegas next week. Look forward. I will be there, so look forward to uh, meeting meeting you. And uh, as I said, we'll have several technical people there, so we'll be glad to answer qu uh, additional questions that might come up. And please don't hesitate to email Dave Dunham um, if you think of some questions later, or talk to some associates. Uh, uh, and, and questions come up later, I'll be glad to follow up answering them and. Thank you all very much. Well, um, I'm sorry. We, uh, I've, I see some more questions coming in, and since we have some more time, um, yes. uh, let's go through them. So another person asked, how does the auto rinse work? Uh, the auto rinse is computer controlled. The module has a, a high level, uh, top level level sensor, optical level sensor. So we drain and fill the module three times, or this is actually selectable by the operator. Uh, cement wrenches pretty easily in, in cement components. Um, so typically you would need no more than about three rinses of your module, in other words, a fill and drain. And the computer controls this uh, speed of filling and, and, and draining and this operation takes about a minute and a half um, between samples to um, uh, to actually rinse the module and then fill it with clean fluid so you're ready to add uh, another sample and run another sample. Um, but it's quite automatic and and uh, uh, as I mentioned during the lecture, the the Universal liquid module has a built-in pump, so it's drawing fluid from a source. So this can uh, can be a container, a five-gallon container, or a gallon bottle of uh, uh, sitting on the on the sh um, uh, next to the instrument or underneath the instrument. If it's a five-gallon container, uh, it can draw it up from the floor. So it has a very good uh, diaphragm-type pump. 
to pull clean fluid up for rinsing purposes. And then it's going to go into a drain container. Since this is a solvent, you don't want to dump it down the drain. And that drain container also has level sensors. So when it gets full, it will stop the ability to uh, keep adding fluid to it so you don't have any overflow. And uh, it's time to uh, drain your uh, the rinse container or the waste container. And that comes with the instrument, the module. Okay, that's great. Um, we have another viewer who asked, could the tornado overcome the effects of trace amounts of liquid in the dry powder samples of having particles stick together, such as oil or va water vapor? Um, part of that's going to be um, dictated by the um, uh, how much water vapor we might have. Um, and, and what I mean uh, by that is um, uh, obviously you'd like it dry, but definitely a few percent uh, moisture can be uh, can be uh, present, and it can disperse that. Um, it, it's one of those things you, you'd probably want to try and, and compare it to um, uh, running it in a wet state. Wet state, you have more control over your dispersion. Uh, you can sonicate, you can wet, so you can add chemical dispersants. Uh, usually not so much required chemical dispersants when you're running in solvents. But uh, the tide can overcome quite a bit, but it's a, a kind of thing you'd have to test to see uh, what the upper limit, especially if it's an oil contaminate. I think you mentioned oil contamination. Uh, that's going to be a little more stickier than something that might be dry. Um, but it does overcome uh, uh, moisture, but there are limits, uh, and it's the kind of thing that you'd want to test. But if you're doing dry sieving, if you're doing sieving already, then the tornado can do the same, uh, you know, can do those kinds of samples. If you're not having a problem doing sieving, the tornado is not going to have a problem. That's great. Well. Once again, I would like to thank Ed so much for his presentation. Um, that was very informative, and we had some great questions. Um, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through July of 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time, and bye, everyone. Bye.